hello. Welcome to the Chasing Dreams podcast. Welcome to season three, where we have our special guest, Miss Alana Washington, and we are talking about obedience, okay? And I'm going to let her introduce herself to you all just in one moment. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Tiara. My name is is Ilona Washington. I am a mom first, um, but an author, publisher, speaker, t-shirt designer, I don't know, marketer. I've been um, corporate marketing for 20 years and um, originally hailed from the D.C. area. We say area. Yes, we do. Um, but now, um, lived a little bit all over the South and now I'm just outside of Philly. I'm enjoying life. I'm a director of marketing for an education management company. We also publish children's books. So we are very, very busy, especially during this time of COVID trying to keep these schools and teachers up and running. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you for all that you're doing, um, for our teachers and for our education system and as a whole, for sure. Thanks. Of course. So we like to start every episode by asking, like, what is the dream for you? Like, I know it's the Chasing Dreams podcast, but let me tell you, this wasn't my dream. Okay. Like, my dream, honestly, was to get married, have four kids, and live in, like, Reston, Virginia, right? I wanted... That's oddly specific. (laughs) Right. I mean, I love Reston. I live there. Okay, gotcha. (laughs) Yeah. So I just wanted a quiet life off the radar. My kids having kids, just chilling, playing with the grandkids, you know, sitting on the swing with my husband holding hands and just dying peacefully in my sleep, right? But God was like, nah, sis, that's not for you. (laughs) I understand. (laughs) Right. So my dream actually has become his dream for me, like whatever he's called me to do. So my dream really is to help inspire people to live free from the pain of their past. Mm -hmm. So my next question being, when did you realize the dream and how has it changed? So you kind of touched a little bit on that, but walk us through uh, when it changed and when you started to submit to his dream for your life. Oh, let's see. I always thought that I could do it part time or, you know, I kind of want to tell my story, but I don't want everybody to know. <laughs> I'll just volunteer here. I'll just tell my story there. Um, I've been speaking since 2011, um, since um, 2011, sharing my story with other survivors um, of the Me Too movement. But God was like, that's not enough. And every success that I had was wiped away. Mm. And then I finally saw the light, like, okay, he wants me to put this in the front and not make it the back burner. And then once I started writing my book and speaking, not just to other survivors, but speaking to the world about prevention and the effects of it, that's when everything came and my life got a lot more settled. So basically I wasn't being obedient. It was more reluctant obedience. I was kind of doing it, but I really didn't really want to do it. Yeah. So let's go into what reluctant obedience means. Okay. So reluctant obedience is, let's say you have a kid and he's upstairs. This is a true example. He's upstairs <laughs> playing PlayStation right now. And you've asked him, for two days to do the daggone dishes and he still hasn't done the daggone dishes. So you disconnect the Wi-Fi, you go upstairs, you you unplug the PlayStation from the wall, and then he goes downstairs and does those dishes. That's reluctant obedience. And that's how I have been living. Like, I knew God told me to do something, but it wasn't until he changed that Wi-Fi password to unplug the PlayStation from the wall (laughs) that I got up and I was like, all right, fine, I'll do it, you know? But there have been times when my son would go downstairs and the kitchen is clean, the trash is taken out, you know, he's doing all of this stuff, the doors are locked because he's crazy. And I'm like, what made you do that? And he was like, I don't know, I just wanted to do it. I just knew it had to be done. 
So we all, oh. I know. And for a while, he was like that for quite a few months. And he's been slacking, but it's quarantine. I can't really, you know, blame him. He's yeah. Late. Yeah, but he's doing the schoolwork, so that's all that really matters. But it's it's like the mentality we have, thinking that we can just put it off or do it later, but then something forces us to do it, and we do it instead of having the spirit of, let me hunker down. I know I'm supposed to do this thing in right. this timely fashion, so let me get this done. Absolutely. So what was the Wi-Fi change code? What, what was the PlayStation Core in your life that finally made you decide to be obedient? I had a job. I was a marketing supervisor. I started off as like a, a lead generation analyst. It's for a B2B company. And then in like four months, they promoted me as a supervisor. So I was managing like four people. And I was doing such a good job for the sales team. They were like, we want you to fly to Portugal and train the people over there. So I was like that. And all the while, I was like low key writing my book off to the side because okay. it was 100 remote work, 100 nice. percent remote work. So I was like, yeah, I'll just, you know, write it. I really wasn't hunkering down and making any progress, but I was doing it because I knew I was being obedient. I was supposed to be <laughs> obedient. So. I fly to Portugal and over in Europe, you know, people have this attitude of Americans. We're the angry American. They didn't really, they didn't really know how to take me, but they fell in love with me after a couple of days. We had such a good time. My company was like, oh, um, just go ahead and spend the weekend in Lisbon. We'll pay for your hotel. So, yes. Don't mind if I do. Correct. <laughs> so I had me a good old time. I came back. I was running stuff. I did a presentation for the um, the CEO because we were based in Sweden. He flew out to America and I did this big presentation about our um, lead gen sources and um, how to optimize all of our campaigns, all of this stuff. And like everyone was loving me. Come January, I don't know, I've been like eight months or so. Come January, my boss leaves her position. She takes another position at another company and then they just lay me off. They got rid of my entire department. And I'm like, how could you do me like that? Right. Like, like <laughs> do you not see all the, the help that I've done for this company? Like, really, y'all? And then I was like, God, really? Like, I was doing everything right. Like, I had never gotten in trouble at my company, my Right. My folks love me. The team love me. Everybody love me. Like, what is going on? And then the light flickered, like, you need to write that book. Mm. So I wrote that book in 12 weeks. And I had been working on that sucker for, like, three, four years. <laughs> three, four years? Yes. Yes. Ma'am. I know. That's I was like a part of the day. <laughs> it, and it wasn't even the same book I had worked on before because I lost that. It's like, I was just. I wasn't feeling it. You know, I knew I was supposed okay. to do it, but I didn't really want to do it. And God was like, oh, yeah, you're you going to want to do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what was one of the biggest challenges you faced in writing your book? Um, the biggest challenge I faced was telling my truth without bashing the people in the book. That's true. And, and yeah. And I, and I had to, in order for people to grasp how the abuse affected me, they had to understand how the adults in my life treated me. Yeah. And they didn't appreciate that, but I'm just like, I have to tell the story because there are other women and even men out here are going through the same thing. And if I sugarcoat it and make sure that everybody was all great to me and I was just abused, that's that's not my truth. And then they're wondering, well, what's wrong with my parents, you know, or what's wrong with my uncle or whatever. Yeah. So how did you go about finding that balance? Like, how did you tell your story truthfully without bashing those people? I stuck to the facts. Mm. I didn't, um, and I talked about how what was said or what was done made me feel. Mm -hmm. I didn't accuse anyone of something that I didn't have the answer to. You know how people are saying, well, maybe she didn't like you because she she didn't like your daddy or because you were brown skinned and your sister was light skinned. I was like, I don't have facts to that. Like, right. Right. So I can only say what 
was said to me and what was done to me and how that affected me. That's fair. And I think um, it's definitely one of those fine lines when you're trying to be transparent so that you can help people. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I'm still getting some flack from my first book where like people in my family are like, all this was going on. And I'm like, yeah, like this is what I've been dealing with. Because I feel like a lot of times we carry um, our baggage in silence. Yep. And so even the people who feel like they know you best have no idea what's actually going on because we we keep it in. We we bottle it in um, and we put on this mask and everything's okay, you know? Um, so I definitely commend you for the strength it took to tell your story completely um, and, and not disregard how those people felt, but to put a greater priority on helping other people. Right. Thank you. Absolutely. So what would you say is your number one secret to success? My number one secret to success. I would say consistency, but I'm not consistent. But I know a lot of people say that. Okay. Um, (laughs) I would say the success I've had is I've gone for it, like the speaking events I've gotten, um, being on, you know, TV, all of that stuff is me making those phone calls and putting myself out there and getting to know the right people because introverted does not describe me. That's like I'm on a whole nother level. Like I'm chilling in this quarantine, if that's any indication of how introverted I am. Yep. (laughs) But I have a marketing and sales background, so I can cold call. And then when I tell people my story, because it's so unique, you know, I have parents who went to Ivy League, but I became a stripper. And they're like, what the hell? So <laughs> yeah, people want to hear my story, which is which is good, but they won't know if I don't. If you if don't tell them. My, right, if I don't tell them. So um, just picking up the phone and sending those emails and making those calls and doing what you got to do to, to get yourself seen. Gotcha. So what final thoughts do you have for us as an audience? Honestly, do what God is calling you to do because he's going to make you do it. Anyway, like <laughs> we'll change the Wi-Fi password. Right. Right. So um, it was like um, Jonah in the belly of the whale, right? I mean, it's yeah, he's, he's going to make you do it. He's going to make you so uncomfortable, uh, so frustrated that you're going to get to the point where you're like, dang, I got to do this thing. And then whatever fear or anxiety you have if, behind it, once you do it, it's going to be the biggest release you've mm-hmm. ever felt. And then you're going to wonder, why didn't I do this sooner? It's like the big chop. Right. <laughs> Right. It's like the big chop. Everyone wants to keep their hair. But then once the and every person who's chopped off their hair has been like, oh, my God, I feel so free. I love it. And then they just do all the stuff. You know, they do what they really, really want to do. So stop fighting it. Gotcha. Well, this has been a very freeing conversation, I guess I could say, um, but definitely impactful. Where can people find you? So if they want to learn more about your story or maybe purchase one of your books or all of the great things that you're doing. So everything is Elona Washington. I've kept it simple. It's um, <laughs> E-L-O-N-A. I'm primarily on Facebook and Instagram. I do have a Twitter. Um, oh, I got a TikTok, but I am a lurker. Yo. <laughs> I don't even have the app. It's crazy. I just see it on on the other platforms. (laughs) It's you will get nothing done. Like you just won't. It's a time waster, but it's hilarious. If you need a joke or you need a pick me up, get on TikTok. Get on TikTok. Well, you know I'm big on my time management, so I I don't need nothing that's going to get me. Oh yeah, don't don't download it. Don't download it. But my sister is on it, and she always sends me videos, or I'll see it on Twitter, and so I see some of them. Like the the popular ones, but I ain't yeah. got. I can't. Well, you you need to go on my Facebook page. I posted one. It says when God made short girls, and you're gonna yes. Probably going to enjoy that one. Yes, we're going <laughs> to enjoy that one. It's hilarious. 
Awesome. Well, thank you for being a part of the Chasing Dreams podcast um, and just your support overall. I think we've worked together on a number of different projects at this point. So thanks for being one of my business besties. <laughs> Well, thank you. And thank you for having me. So um, I'm thinking about I used to have a, a local TV show down in Philly, but, you know, with I'm not doing that anymore. So I'm thinking of just doing like a like a little Zoom chat, like 30 minutes. So I would love to have you on because I love your story. Of course. Of yeah. course. Definitely. Any way I can help support, I am down for the cause. Yep. Us on the speaking panel has been amazing, and I want to continue this. It's been wonderful. Yes, yes, yes. Well, guys, we will see you next week on the Chasing Dreams podcast.